And now, please join me in welcoming a man who has led the charge in educating and inspiring action on the climate crisis, the founder and chairman of the Climate Reality Project, Vice President Al Gore. Thank you again, Sarah. Uh, here we are at uh, 3.35 a.m. in New Jersey, just across the river from Manhattan. Thank you very, very much. And looking forward to your exciting interview live with Kuala Lumpur right after this brief slide presentation. Last hour, we looked at Indonesia. We're staying in the region now, and we're going to look at the important country of Malaysia. Uh, the list of 24, again, is here. Malaysia, as you see, is number 18 on the top 24 list of national global warming pollution emitters. And we're going to look at this uh, beautiful country and some of the impressive progress that has been made. And for our audience in Malaysia this hour, I want to start again with these beautiful, inspiring pictures of the Earth, Earthrise, uh, taken on December 24th, 1968, and then the famous Blue Marble, taken December 7th, 1972. And this image actually illustrates one of the most important facts about the climate crisis. It shows the true nature of the sky from the space shuttle. We look at the sky from the ground, and from our perspective, it looks like a vast and limitless expanse. But it's actually this very thin shell surrounding the planet, the total volume of which is shockingly small, especially when you consider that today we'll dump another 110 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into it as if it's an open sewer. All that global warming pollution has been adding up, trapping an enormous amount of heat energy, and that's what's causing all of the changes that collectively make up the climate crisis. So if you look, how we, uh, look at how we got to this point, historically, uh, uh, the greatest source has been the emissions of CO2 from the burning of fossil fuels. And especially after World War II, these emissions started skyrocketing upward there looks uh, to be a pause now in the upper right. For three years in a row, global emissions have leveled off. Maybe this is an inflection point. A lot of us who are optimistic believe that it really is. But let's look <coughs> carefully at Malaysia's mean, uh, greenhouse gas uh, emissions, uh, an, an unusual pattern. Uh, but the trend is definitely uh, upward, and we're going to look at where these emissions come from. In Malaysia, approximately half of all of the global warming pollution comes from the energy sector. And the next biggest source, a third, is from land use and forestry. And like neighboring Indonesia, there has been a problem of burning forests and peat the lands in order, and peat forests in order to plant uh, palm oil plantations. And this is an ongoing uh, uh, problem the other sectors, uh, waste and agriculture and, and industry. But going uh, a little bit deeper on the energy sector, we can see electricity and heat, transportation, manufacturing, and construction make up uh, the bulk of the energy-related CO2 emissions. Now, Malaysia's been feeling the heat, as we all have. 14 of the 15 hottest years ever measured have been since 2001. And the hottest year of all, this year. Even though there's still two weeks to go, the statisticians uh, have concluded no way it can change. This is the record-breaking heat year. And we have seen the consequences well, all over the world. If you go back to 1880, you can see how inexorably these emissions uh, have been going up. And right in uh, Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia, we've seen people really affected by a heat stroke. These soldiers and police were overcome by the unusually uh, hot temperatures. A lot of schools have been forced to close. 250 schools closed because of the lingering heat wave this year. Now, you're going to see in Malaysia, the, according to the uh, scientific analyses, a huge increase in the number of heat wave days if we continue to see the upsurge in temperatures that the scientists have predicted as a result of man-made global warming. In fact, uh, from 
10 days in 1990 to as much as 300 days in, uh, at the end of this century. That can have a profoundly uh, damaging effect on the quality of life and on many aspects uh, of life. Now, a second uh, consequence of the climate crisis is that all this extra heat increases the evaporation of water vapor off the oceans, which when it comes over the land results in these unprecedented large downpours that occur in a compressed period of time and create unprecedented floods. Some people call these rain bombs now. Northern Malaysia's uh, worst flooding uh, on, on record a couple of years ago drove 200,000 people from their homes. Uh, we have seen repeated uh, flood events with some areas getting a month's worth of rain in a single night. This was last year in Tanjung Kuala, uh, and I could literally show lots and lots of these uh, flood events, but the experts in Malaysia have said, look, this is a, a result of global warming. And of course, all over the world, the scientific community understands this fact very clearly now. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's ironic that the same extra heat trapped in the atmosphere by man-made global warming pollution not only disrupts the water cycle and leads to these massive downpours and floods and mudslides, but it also leads to longer and deeper periods of drought in between the downpours. And so we get these record uh, drought events uh, uh, that have created such uh, uh, problems in water rationing and water emergencies and some of the driest uh, conditions on record uh, in Malaysia and in uh, neighboring uh, Singapore. This is uh, uh, a famous lake uh, in Malaysia earlier this year. As you can see, it's almost completely dried up. Now also, air pollution is another consequence of the reliance on uh, dirty fuels and forest burning that interrupts air travel, creates very high and unhealthy levels of uh, air pollution on a seasonal basis. And this is due to human activities, which can be changed and uh, can yield to a solution. As many know, the melting of all the ice-covered regions on Earth, particularly Antarctica and Greenland, where the huge masses of ice are, the, the accelerated melting is now raising sea level. And of course, Malaysia uh, is especially vulnerable to this uh, problem. And uh, populations in low-lying coastal areas are, are particularly affected. Now, I talked about forests. Uh, we have seen a massive loss uh, of uh, forest land uh, in uh, Malaysia. Uh, uh, this uh, sea level rise issue, before I leave that, I want to mention that two million people are threatened in Malaysia with just a two uh, degree centigrade rise. But that's the bad news. Let's shift to the good news, and there's lots of it, starting with the fact that Malaysia joined with virtually every nation in the world in Paris exactly one year ago uh, to reach the Paris Agreement, which has been a watershed event that sent a powerful signal to business and industry and local governments and regional governments all over the world. We're seeing this momentum build now. And the specific commitments that Malaysia made uh, included an unconditional 35% reduction in greenhouse gas uh, intensity and a reduction of uh, emissions uh, beyond uh, that uh, commitment. Uh, and the reason they made this commitment is in part because they know that we have the solutions at hand. And let's briefly look at the dramatic reduction in the cost of onshore wind. And of course, Malaysia is taking advantage uh, of that because some locations in Malaysia are very promising uh, for wind. In fact, on a global basis, wind could supply 40 times as much electricity as the entire global consumption of electricity. Solar is even more promising. The cost down curve in solar is almost like computer chips. It's really, uh, it has come down dramatically and it is really continuing to come down at a dramatic pace. And if you look at uh, Malaysia's solar resource, along with neighboring Indonesia and Vietnam, it's absolutely incredible. So we're, we're seeing Malaysia begin to take advantage of that. 
uh, and mini grid systems can be connected to solar panels. And this is one of the most exciting things. Malaysia is now the third largest producer of solar cells and modules in the entire world. A lot of jobs are being created in this new industry. In fact, over 19,000 new jobs in renewable in the solar industry alone in Malaysia, which is just incredibly exciting. So more can be done, of course. Uh, Malaysia could enhance its commitment to make absolute uh, reductions and decrease the current and future reliance on coal, which is always uh, a good thing to do. One of the most important things that Malaysia could do is to, to pr protect the forests uh, and the peatlands uh, much more effectively and eliminate the fossil fuel subsidies and diversify away from fossil fuels and toward renewables, reduce methane emissions from oil and gas uh, production, and go on and ratify the Paris Agreement as the majority of nations have already done. But I'm optimistic about what Malaysia's future holds and about the commitment and progress being made uh, by Malaysia. And I have no doubt that Malaysia is going to help make a sustainable future a reality. Thank you. Sarah, back to you. Thank you, Vice President Gore, as always.